At this time, we're going to ask that everybody stay in their seat. You can kneel where you are. I'm going to go ahead and kneel right up here. We're going to pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we're so grateful that you are a loving God and that you are such a great God and that you care about each one of us so much. We want to thank you for us being able to gather back together and worship together. And we also are thankful for those people who are still at home, who still love you and are still part of our family. Lord, we trust in you and we desperately want to do your will. So we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to help us to know what to do in these trying times. We also ask, Lord, that you be with all those who are sick and all those with health issues. We especially want to bring before you Cindy and Martha, Jennifer, Olga, and Samantha. And there's so many others, Lord, who are going through hard times that we ask that you be with them and help them to have blessings for their bodies, Lord, and help them to be healthy. Lord, I also want to ask blessings for my students who I haven't seen in over a week now. Help them to those who are struggling, Lord, and who are having hard times, you know, be, having to stay at home. Please be with each one of them, Lord, and help them to be able to also be healthy and to have food and to have the support that they need, Lord. Lord, we also ask that you bring peace to everybody there's so much going on. There's so much fear and there's so much going on that brings us anxiety and takes away our peace. Lord, help us to trust in you. Help us to look to you and to dwell in your peace and understanding and not worry about each way the wind blows. And Lord, we yearn for the time that you return and that we will see true justice, Lord, and that we will know your ways. And then we're on this earth. Help us to be able to get along with one another and understand that there's trials and tribulations that, you know, some of us go through that others do not. That there are things that each one of us need to consider and that we each need to pray and understand and to learn about each other. And Lord, we especially want to be with those people who are going through financial times, who are struggling with money, and those people who have had blessings with money, help each to look to you, to be able to know, you know what to do in these trying situations. And when we have blessings, Lord, to remember that you are the one who brings those blessings to us. Though we want to again thank you and in Jesus' name we say, Amen. To, uh, I want to, oops, sorry about that. I'm so used to just depending on this mic here for the, for the live audience, I forget to use this one. Got to get to used to some things after being away for 11 weeks, right? Um, I want to just uh, uh, say thank you to Judy who brought these uh, magazines. It's a special Signs of the Times issue magazine entitled COVID-19, Facing the Crisis with Confidence. 
So I want to thank you for bringing those. Those are available out in, in, uh, in the lobby for you to take. And um, I thank you for everyone here um, sitting the way that you're sitting. You, you're following the taped uh, pews here. Um, for those of you who are watching us live, our congregation looks quite different because of the way everybody's sitting in a zigzagged order. <clears throat> we had a board meeting a couple of weeks ago, and we discussed all of the safety measures we want to take when we reopen the church, and this was one of them. And I want to thank Jacqueline. Uh, I'm not sure where Jacqueline is, uh, but it was Jacqueline's idea to do this sort of checkerboard uh, seating arrangement, so thank you. I know it feels different. Um, I know we didn't have our meet and greet time. You know, at least for me, <clears throat> when we meet and greet and shake hands and hug and everything, that sort of creates the mood, doesn't it? It really creates the mood in the church for church worship and, and just we're excited to be here and it just charges us up. Well, that's absent. And uh, in fact, um, after the worship service, I won't be going back there and shaking everybody's hand. So that's going to be absent. And so uh, for those of you who are watching this live, the atmosphere feels, if it felt different, when I was here practically alone, just preaching into a camera, um, it, this is a different feel, isn't it? It's, it's just a different feel. One Sabbath school class, one on Zoom. Uh, my class met over here, and we uh, were all sitting apart from each other. And um, so it's just, it's just got a different feel to it. Um, it's sort of like flatline almost. But I want to encourage you to continue to come. For those of you who are comfortable, maybe somebody that's watching us live right now, maybe you'll think of, become, of coming next week or in a couple of weeks. We understand, you know, you want to take a little bit more time. But uh, continue coming to church and enjoying the service and the songs, with less songs. I, I know, it's, you know, children don't come up for children's story. And so we really don't know how long we're going to uh, keep on using these these new practices in our worship service. And so I have no idea. But we're going to be discussing that at, you know, amongst our leaders. And, and you can even email me and we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. So it is, it is a little bit. How many of you have ever been away from home for a long time? Okay. Um, is it good to come back home? Isn't it? So I want to say, I know, I know uh, if you can just look at the, the, the folks on the banner, welcome back where it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's hear a shout, amen. amen. It's good to be back here in God's house. It really is. Um, you know, when you go on a vacation and you have to you sit in, uh, sleep in a strange bed and use strange uh, restrooms and everything, it's good to come back home. Um, and open up your own refrigerator, right? I'm spitting all over here. I don't know what's happening to me. Um, open up your own refrigerator. Sleep in your own bed. Um, use your own facilities. It's, it's good to be back home. You can just let your hair down and just be you and enjoy your house. Um, and I have a quick story to tell. I've, I've shared this before. It's not about coming home, but it's about coming back to a tent now, if any of you have ever slept in a tent, I'll tell you this time it was really, really good to come back into a tent. So this happened uh, back in 1998. So this is quite a while ago. Well, how many years ago is that? 1998? 22 years ago. 22 years ago. Um, at the church that I was pastoring, I was, I was uh, working with the youth. We all went on a trip to the Grand Canyon. This was in California, so we took a trip out here to Arizona. We went to the Grand Canyon, and uh, I think we left on a Thursday and then had to go back on Sunday or left Friday and went back Monday, one of those long weekends. And one of our goals, this group, there was about 80 of us in this church group, many of them young people. One of our goals was to go hike down on Bright Angel Trail all the way down to the Colorado River. Anybody ever make that hike before? All the way down to the Colorado River. Vernon has. Now, our goal was not only to go down to the Colorado River, it was to come back up on the same day. Anybody ever do that before? 
Uh, I got you on that one, Vernon. <laughs> and uh, so that was our goal. Now, uh, right in the middle is what they call, I believe, Indian Gardens. It's about halfway down. So one way, I believe it's about nine miles. And it's, a, it's pretty steep. In fact, if you go hiking down steep uh, trails, I'd rather come back. I'd rather come back up than go down. Anybody like me? You'd rather hike up than go down? I'd rather do that any day. To me, it was harder on my feet and my knees going down. So we went all the way down to the Colorado River. We left at four, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. We made it at 8.45 in the morning to the river. And, uh, and this was, mind you, this was in July of 1998. So it was probably 110 degrees. But in July, we hiked down. And there were signs along the way. We were warned ahead of time by the rangers. And there were signs along the way going down not to hike back up during those hot months before 4 p.m. So what we did is we got there a little before 9 a.m., and we just waited in a little. The river was too icy cold for us, so we found this little pool, sort of a pool, and we just were, we took lunch, and we had fun, and we were just soaking and uh, just resting and sleeping, etc., until 4 p.m. At 4 o'clock p.m., with full clothes and everything, we dunked ourselves in the water. Just all clothes. We just wet ourselves, ready for the hike back up. So we left around 4 p.m., between 4 and 4.30. And we were hiking up and hiking up and hiking up. And we had to take breaks because there were those uh, of our party that were in not the best shape. In fact, some of individuals, we were very concerned going down. We thought we were going to have to uh, call a helicopter. But we were hiking back up, and many of the individuals had to take a break. When I go hiking, I don't like to take breaks often, because I get more tired out I stop and stop and stop. But we had to take a lot of breaks, and some of them did not have water. And mind you, we took some flashlights. It began to get dark on the way up. Everybody's flashlight died. Their batteries died, except mine. Now, there's no light posts on Bright Angels Trail in Grand Canyon. There's no lights out there. So it was very, very dark. There was about 19 of us that went down. There was about 90, close to 90 in the whole group. About 19, 19 of us went down. My flashlight was the only one that worked. So what we had to do was we had, in fact, one young lady almost fell off the trail. And we barely caught her. So it was dangerous. So in my backpack, I had a rope. It's always good to take a rope with you. And luckily, I had a rope, and it was about a good 20 feet long. And so what we did was we had each, I don't remember if we wrapped it around our waist or we just held onto it, but we had a rope. And because there was no flashlight except mine, I was towards the back of the line, flashing my light up ahead on the trail for them. And with the light that sort of glows around you, when you have a flashlight, the couple of people behind me used that light. We all had a rope. So we were walking, people were getting cramps. We left around 4 p.m. We got up to the top at 1 a.m. At 1 o'clock. So how many hours is that? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Nine hour hike back up. And we were walking like penguins. We were just walking like this. Our feet were so hurting. It was good to be back home. <laughs> Even though it was a tent, it was really, really good to be back home. I want to share a story with you this morning of a people, they didn't have to make an 18-mile round-trip hike down to a trail and back up, and they were exhausted. They had to make a hike that took hundreds of miles. So I want to share the story with you about coming back home, and I want to use the story of the Israelites coming back home after their exile in Babylon for a long time. And them coming back home and some of their experiences when they arrived back home. I'm going to talk about that this morning. And then see, are there some similarities? There's dissimilarities, but some similarities for us coming back home in public worship. You want to hear the story? Okay, so you have to open uh, your phones or if you have your own Bible to the book of Ezra. 
I have just a few slides. I'm not going to share everything. And I know we're trying to stay away from you using the Pew Bibles. So if you have your own Bible or if you have it on your phone, um, I want you to turn to the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. Um, so before we read uh, the book of Ezra, I want to share some background, background information on the events leading up to their return. So I'm going to give you some history here, and I'll be as just succinct as, as possible. Some background info on everything that led up to their return to Israel. So after a long stay... Uh, in the capital city of Babylon. It was one of the, the most opulent city in the world at that time. No longer exists as, as it did back then. Um, after a long stay over there, the Israelites returned to their homeland. And Ezra chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 64 and 65, I won't read it, but that's just for your reference. Ezra 2, verses 64 and 65 states that there were 49,697 people that returned. Now as it goes, it's sort of hard to see it in the book of Ezra, but it may have happened in waves. It didn't happen all at once. You know, it may have happened in, in waves. Also, there's always safety in numbers when you're traveling in a caravan, and so it's not like just a couple of families left, and then a couple of months later, you know, a few individuals. These were a lot of people going, but it may have taken a, a little bit of time um, Babylon ruled for 70 years, but the chief deportations, uh, there was one in 605, the chief uh, deportations took place in 597 B.C. Um, under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And here's where uh, the Bible says this, and I'm just going to read it here. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 14 says this, Then he, referring to the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he led away into exile all Jerusalem and all the captains and all the mighty men of valor. So these were important people that he took. 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths, blacksmiths, silversmiths, goldsmiths, none remained except the poorest people of the land. So that was 70 years earlier. So only the poor people were left behind. All the bigwigs King Nebuchadnezzar took with him. And another deportation took place about 10 years later in 586 B.C. in King Nebuchadnezzar's 19th year of reign, the Bible says. Now this one was especially devastating because of what happened to God's house, um, what we call the temple. The Bible says about this one, and I'm going to read here from 2 Kings, and this was, this, was a, this was a bad one. And if you want to open your Bibles with me to 2 Kings chapter 25, and starting with verse 8, I'll read a few verses here to, so that you can just get a really good flavor of what's happening here. Second King chapter 25 and verse 8 says this, Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebu, excuse me, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord. He burned it. The king's house, he burned the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. So the temple was burned, the uh, king's house, the palace was burned, and all the houses of Jerusalem, even every great house he burned with fire. This is Nebuchadnezzar's captain. So all the army of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Only the farmers were left behind. Not any of the smiths, not any people with skills, just the farmers to till the land. Now, and now this is interesting. In Solomon's temple, remember this happened in 586 B.C. Solomon's temple, before you go into the huge door in this temple, the door was flanked on each side by these pillars. You know what these pillars were made of? They were made of bronze. These things were huge. They weighed tons. You know what? They destroyed, the Bible says here in verse 12, 13, 
The bronze pillars which were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea, this is like a huge tub, which were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. So in 586 B.C., along with the deportation, the temple was destroyed. The city was decimated. The walls, the houses were burned. It was just a mess. It was like, you know, during World War II, you've seen some of those pictures or videos where after the Allies or the Axis powers bomb a certain city, you see what it looks like afterwards? All it is is just walls with no roofs, and it's just in shambles. That's the picture I get when the Babylonians came some years later in 586 and just decimated the place. Now, why did all of this happen? Again, I'm referring to what had happened before the Israelites are coming back, and I'm going to tie it together. Why did the, all this happen? Well, it's a long story, but I'm just going to give you the skinny of it. God tried his best to bless his people Excuse me, that they might be the head and not the tail of all nations. He actually said this, that they'd be the head of the arrow instead of the, the rear. He gave them blessings and protection in, accordan, in accordance with covenants that God ratified with his people. A covenant is basically an agreement between two bar parties, and th there's terms to this covenant. There's, there's terms to it. And this covenant, as would be expected, included God's laws, his civil laws, um, his sundry laws, sundry laws are additional laws, diverse laws, ceremonial laws, and of course, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. Well, living in obedience to God's laws would naturally bring blessings in its wake because they promoted morality, they promoted strong families, they promoted health, they promoted uh, uh, personal usefulness, justice in their courts, and a strong religious undergirding that tied everything together. And that undergirding was a belief and a personal, a belief in and a personal relationship with the Creator God. It was a monotheistic faith, is, what's, is what it's called. Monotheistic meaning only in one God. Life was good if the covenant was respected and observed. Well, Israel started out as a theocracy but ended up as a monarchy, which means kings and queens. A theocracy is where the God is a God and he's the king or the leader of his people. That's a theocracy, only one God. Well, it became a monarchy and the long 500 plus year of this monarchy could be illustrated in a graph that would resemble an EKG and I have a, and I have a, a picture there of this EKG. And the reason I say that is because there were good kings and bad kings. Good kings, bad kings. Good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. That was a long 500-year history. Well, God finally gave them up to their devices, namely seeking to serve multiple pagan gods. And it was as if God said, okay, I'll let you do you, and I'll do me. I'll send you back to where you originally started eons ago. I'll send you back to your nana. Now, Ur of ancient southern Mesopotamia, they call it Sumer, was the city where Father Abraham came from, centuries even before this. It was situated about 140 miles southeast of Babylon. Its patron god was Nana, the moon god, and the city's name literally means the abode of Nana. So God sent them back to their Nana. <laughs> He sent them back to Babylon. You want to worship these other gods? All right, I'll send you back to where you came from. The Bible says this in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 and 16. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Not only Israel, but the temple. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. And these last five words are very significant. Until there was no remedy. Until there was no remedy. That's the skinny of it. That's what happened before 
uh, 70 years earlier, before they came back home, before they came back home. So here's the actual return. Um, there were different kings, Persian kings, who allowed the Jews to return after their 70-year stint in Babylon, in Nana, <laughs> going back to Nana. Um, the restoration of the Jewish exiles, it began under King Cyrus. He reigned from 559, I'll spare you those dates, but King Cyrus, who, was allowed, who allowed them to return to Judah with all of the captured temple treasures. Now, when King Nebuchadnezzar came to Israel and he in, in decimated the place, he took all of the gold and silver and all of the temple treasures with him back to his palace, and he stored them in his treasury. Well, King Cyrus says, I'm going to let you guys go back. Not only am I going to let you go back, you get to take all of your temple treasures with you. It's a good king, King Cyrus of Persia. The temple was consecrated, so the temple was rebuilt. I'm just giving you just a quick background. The temple was rebuilt in 516 B.C. by official permission of Darius I. This is another Persian of Darius I. And then, last but not least, Ezra eventually comes onto the scene and wins the approval of King Artaxerxes I. Now we're into the 400s B.C. So King Artaxerxes allowed them to return with additional exiles to promote obedience to the law. And Nehemiah is the one that rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. So one day the prophet Daniel... He is a statesman of high ranking in the Babylonian palace and a faithful man of God. This is just immediately before their return. He was reading and contemplating the book of Jeremiah that confirmed his thoughts. The end of the 70-year reign of Babylon is at hand, and God's promise to restore the Holy Land to his people was just about to take place. So Daniel here is reading Jeremiah, where Jeremiah prophesied about this a long time ago. And he begins to pray this most heartfelt, amazing prayer. And you can read about this prayer for yourself in Daniel chapter 9. In fact, it's the bulk of Daniel chapter 9. David, King David, much earlier, he expressed his one single desire this way on the screen. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek. That I, might, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Amen? David just wanted to be in God's presence in the house, in the temple. Daniel himself was just anxious and actually he was a little bit weary, hopefully, hoping that you know, the people wouldn't commit the same mistakes and they would go back to their own land and they wouldn't do what they re did 70 years earlier. As is not strange for God to do, God chose a foreign king with foreign gods as his accomplice. King Nebuchadnezzar, 70 years earlier, was one of those. But this time it was King Cyrus of Persia, conqueror of Babylon, that God moved not to punish the Jews, as King Nebuchadnezzar did, but to preserve and protect them. He wrote a decree to repatriate the Jews to their own land and to rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. Um, some time ago, my uh, wife and son and I, in fact, I think, I think Cynthia and Ish may have been there, we went to this place here. It's called the Persian Room. Anybody ever been there? In Scottsdale. We went to the Persian room in Scottsdale, beautiful restaurant, good Persian food, uh, delicious rice, basmati rice, and uh, just great, great, great food. And so we went in there to eat, and uh, here's another picture of it. Um, you, you, this is what you see when you enter. In fact, did you, see, did you see the king here in this picture? Look at that. There's a king there, whoever that is. I have an idea who might be with that etching, that glass etching there. But right here, this is what you see when you enter. And where I'm circling right there, this is, the, uh, this is where the hostess would stand. There's a, a desk there, and that's where the hostess stood. So we went over there, and uh, you know, we checked in. And right on this side, 
here's a wall right here, right where the edge of the screen is. There's a wall there, and there was a big, huge, beautiful picture of a king. It looked like the one that you saw in the slide earlier. So I asked, I asked the hostess, I said, well, who is this supposed to be? And you know what she said? She said, oh, that's King Cyrus. And this is authentic cooking. It's not, it's not a Persian restaurant with Mexican cooks. It's not a Chinese restaurant with Mexican cooks. These, this is authentic food. And so, and she looked Persian. She was, she was foreign to me. She was foreign. I was a foreigner to her. She was a foreigner to me. She said King, Pers uh, King Cyrus. And then I said, oh, really? I said, oh, I know about King Cyrus. I said, did you know that King Cyrus is very, very favorable to the Jews? And she just kind of her eyes like open, like she didn't know that information. I said it on purpose, sort of trying to provoke her to conversation. But he was very, very favorable to the Jews, um, which he was. He was very favorable to them and allowed them to come back. Um, so their mixture, now let's go back to their coming back, and then we're going to tie this in, and maybe we can learn some things from their return going back home. There's a lot of dissimilarities. We weren't punished. We were not away from worshiping for 11 weeks because we were being punished by God. So there's dissimilarities, I know that. But there may be some similarities of our returning back home to our worship service. Um, when the Israelites were coming back, you know, I think personally that there might have been a mixture of uh, joy with sadness. Um, Babylon was their home for many years, Right? It was their home for many years. Children were born and grew up in Babylon, so they didn't know anything different. Now, I know the Israelites, they taught their children um, about their ways and about the Lord and Yahweh, and they tried to keep them faithful and worshiping God, much like you parents, when you have children in your homes, and, and some of them may be going to public schools or may have other influences around them that you're not particularly in favor of. You want to make sure that your kids remain in the faith, right? You want to make sure they remain in the faith. You want to pray with them. You teach them the Bible, etc. That's what parents do. So I know that they did the same thing then. But they are, had already established roots over there. They knew some neighbors that perhaps were not Jewish. Um, and they were used to city, seeing this glorious city. All of the glitter and display of Babylon. When we were doing our Daniel seminar, I described how Babylon was in those days from, uh, from the historian, uh, I can't remember his name, but he wrote the, the uh, Persian Wars. I can't remember his name at this time, but he gives great description of Babylon. This was an amazing place. For them to come back now, maybe there was a mixture of happiness and sadness. They left this beautiful adorned city to a region that was destroyed by 70 years earlier by Nebuchadnezzar. And this is where I'm tying it in, what I said a few moments ago. Remember what the Babylonians did. They destroyed the temple. They burned houses. They burned the palace. They, dest they destroyed the walls. So it's going back to a place that is just ugly. It's an ugly place. It's home, but it's ugly. It's destroyed. So maybe there were some mixed feelings there. By the seventh month, now you're in the book of Ezra, so go to Ezra chapter 1. Now you're finally saying, now we can read Ezra. He told us to go to that book about 20 minutes ago. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. Ezra 1 verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that's what Daniel the prophet was reading, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his, his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And verse 3, Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem, etc., etc., etc. So this is King Cyrus's decree to let them go back. And then in chapter 3 and verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now when the seventh month came, this is in that particular year of Cyrus's reign, so some months later, the sons of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. So seven months later, we don't know how many times or how many caravans there were, 
But seven months, all of the local towns were filled with the Israelites coming back home from Babylon after a long time. And they gathered as one man to Jerusalem. They all came together. It was a big, huge gathering. No social distancing. Shoulder to shoulder. Squeezed. Children crying. Parents saying, shh. Everybody was there. A lot of people. And then verse 2, Jeshua, the son of uh, Josadak, and his brothers, the priests, they offered, verse 3 says that they offered burnt offerings on an altar that they built for God. In fact, um, they didn't even rebuild the temple yet, but they wanted to make an altar uh, to worship, uh, to uh, offer their thank offerings, etc. So this is all of the people coming back now. Um, I have a slide here that I want you to see. Um, these are the return routes and the dates. So this one here, if you can see it going up, <coughs> by the way, here's Jerusalem and here's Babylon. You don't just cut across the desert here or you'll die. <laughs> Nobody does it. There's nothing out there. It's just arid land. So what they had to do was go what, they, what scholars call the Fertile Crescent. It was, it's not as green now. It's still there, but it's not as green today. The Fertile Crescent followed the, the Tigris, the Euphrates River up here, and then came down. And so you had to take a northerly route if you wanted to go back to Jerusalem. So this is the way they came. So you can barely see this gold line here. This was Zerubbabel's return in 538 B.C. Just under 50,000 people returned. The temple was finished, as I said earlier, in 516. That was the first return. And then the second was Ezra. We're talking about Ezra. In 458 B.C., just under 2,000 returned. And that is Ezra and the third one, Nehemiah. Um, excuse me, Zerubbabel and Ezra. This is their route. Nehemiah in 444 B.C., he returns. And this is the route that he took, just a little south, more south. And that's when the walls were rebuilt. So the first return under Zerubbabel, the temple was finished. The second one under Ezra, there was reforms. I'm going to mention one of the reforms. It has to do with marriage. And then the third one, Nehemiah, the walls were rebuilt. And we've, we've, uh, you've read about Nehemiah before. So let's start concluding and talking about their return. People came back to changes in their region. I'm going to use Arizona language. Tumbleweeds. <laughs> the wind. <sighs> There's nothing out there. Just burnt down stone and tim burnt timber. It was a horrible place to go back to. Would you want to go back to a place like that? Are you happy you're back here this morning, separated from each other, with tape in the middle of the pews? Wouldn't you rather just be together and hug and shake hands like we usually do in our meet and greet time? Wouldn't that be better? Then why did you come back? You knew that there were going to be some changes made for our worship services in Sabbath school because you were informed via email and via the announcements that we made. How many of you read the PDF document on our Tempe website? All the changes taking place. You knew that and, let your ba and yet you're back here. How come you came back? That's the right answer. <laughs> Les says, well, to be home. There's no place. <laughs> There's no place like home, Dorothy said. Even though it could be a tent on our trip to the Grand Canyon. I just, I just want to stop the trip. I want to be in my tent or in your home after a long stay away. But people came back. They came back to changes in their region. There were wild animals, animals, enemies, ruins. Archaeological evidence confirms that the Persian period, so during the Persian kings, the Holy Land was comparatively impoverished in the terms of material stuff. It was impoverished during the Persian period. You want to go home back to that? But that's what they came to. People came back needing to reestablish worship. So that's why they built the altar long before the temple was finished there in 516 B.C. So they had to come back and reestablish worship. Not everyone came back. Some stayed back in Babylon. There were not just 50,000 plus 2,000 people that came back. 
that lived in Babylon. There was a lot, there was a big, huge community in Babylon. So not everybody came back. I'm comfortable where I am. I've got a good job here. I don't want to pack. My son's moving. How, how many of you have ever moved before? The Edelman's recently moved. Wasn't it a joy just packing? Isn't it just, it's one of my favorite things to do is pack up and move. <laughs> it's horrible. I don't want to pack. What's that? It's the worst thing ever. So some people stayed behind. Not everyone came back. Some people opposed their return. Go to chapter 4. You're there in Ezra, chapter 4. There was opposition. Look at verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, uh-oh, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of father's households and said to them, these are the enemies, this is what they're saying to the Jews, let us, let us build with you. Let us build with you. We'll help you out here. We've got strong hands. Because for we, like you, seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of this guy, I don't want to pronounce his name, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of fathers' households of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land, not the, the returnees, the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. So although not specifically named regarding these verses, the people that proffered their help were evidently from the area of Samaria. This is interesting background information from you. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate the New Testament better when I say this. So they were evidently from the area of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Samaria was the capital of Israel. And after the fall of Samaria by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., listen up. After the Assyrians destroyed Samaria, the Assyrian kings, this was before Babylon, they kept importing inhabitants from Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and Syria. Mesopotamia is way over here. Syria is up here. So these Assyrian kings were importing these foreigners to uh, Samaria. And as newcomers, their influence diluted the faith of the locals in Samaria, the local Jews diluted their faith, and all of the Samaritans still believed in Yahweh, their God. Oh, they still believed Him. He was only one God among many. That's what actually ended up happening. This is why in the New Testament, the Samaritans were shunned as undesirable, what I call them, religious hybrids. They hated the Samaritans. Now, you go to the New Testament, you read those stories with new understanding. The Good Samaritan, you ever heard of that story, The Good Samaritan? How could Jesus, how could he have the nerve to ask the people to emulate this man who did good and had compassion, and he happened to be a Samaritan, this no good and desirable religious hybrid? You know, the, they hated the Samaritans. How could Jesus go in John chapter 4 and talk to a woman at the well? How dare he talk to a Samaritan woman? And yet she was the one that ended up evangelizing the town of Samaria, or this town, this Sikar, this town of Samaria called Sikar. She ended up um, evangelizing them, a no good Samaritan woman. This is the history. This is the history of why. The agriculture, if you go back to a land that hasn't been as tilled, now the poor farmers were left, but now you have all of these people coming in. What happens to the food supply? goes way down. The demand goes up, the supply is down, so what do you have to do to the land? Oh, mom! Your kids ever complain of having to dig a hole or rake something or clean up the leaves or something to do some yard work? Did you ever complain of doing yard work when you were a kid? Did Ish, have you ever complained of doing yard work and mom says, go outside and do yard work during this quarantine? Yeah. You complained? <laughs> now you have to till the ground, etc. The architecture, Buildings and homes needed to be repaired. The economy needed to be reestablished. Marketplaces, vendors, jobs. You've got to get a job. How are you going to make money going back? You got, now you have to get a job. 
Now the marketplaces need to be reestablished. You've got to sell your fruit. Religious services needed to be reinstated. That's why they did the altar. All in all, it was a slow process. There was much to do, but it was worth it because they were finally where? They were finally home. It was all worth it. It was a lot of work to do. It didn't just come automatically. The land of their forefathers. It may have been a time of spiritual reflection and retrospect because why did they end up in Babylon in the first place? Disobedience. So when they went back home 70 years later, do you think they were thankful to be home? Maybe there was a little bit of retrospective thinking there. Some of the old men that were, let's say, 85 years old that could make that trip. And they were, what, 15 years old. 15 years old, 70 years earlier. Maybe they remember some of that stuff and they just look around and, oh my goodness, they're just like, <laughs> they can see the, the soldiers, Babylonian soldiers. They can see the fires. They could smell. They could see the people. Oh, if you read about when the Babylonians sieged Jerusalem, it's not a pretty picture. Some of the Jews inside that were stuck in Jerusalem were eating each other because of hunger. Some people were gnawing on their sandals because there was no food. It was horrible. It was horrible. Maybe there was older people that remember what it was like 70 years earlier, and they were just now in tears remembering all the things that took place when they looked at this particular burnt house or God's house destroyed. So there was a lot of retrospection going on. The effect of all of that was exile. The cause, as you said, was disobedience. I'm sure there was regrets. The children were older now. I wonder if there was any blame going on with the little kids. Well, we wouldn't have lost all of this and seen all the destruction and expatriation were it not for our parents' rebellions against God. It's your guys' fault. Now we have to rebuild everything. I wonder if there was a little bit of blame taking place. Remember I mentioned to you here there was reforms <clears throat> under Ezra. And I mentioned marriages. In Ezra chapters 9 and 10, there were mixed marriages going on. And Ezra did not like this. And the leaders did not like this. And they had to do reforms. And what that is about is the God's people, the Israelites, marrying those not of their own faith. That's what mixed marriages are. Now, there are still marriages between a man and a woman. It doesn't mean same gender marriages. But it was a marriage of somebody who followed another God, who didn't believe in Sabbath worship, who didn't believe in only one God. There were mixed marriages. The problem with that is when you bring introduce children into that type of marriage, you're going to get problems. You'll get fights. You'll get disagreement between the parents. You'll get disagreements. There will not be a harmonious family because the thinking and goals are not the same. And what it does is, unfortunately, it tends to negatively impact those of uh, that try to be faithful, those of the true religion, and it impacts them and that's why you have these dastardly Samaritans who are religiously hybrid and nobody liked and they were rejected and they were hated by the Jews. Because, yeah, Yahweh is God, but we also have other gods. In fact, the conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman with Jesus, what's the first question she asked Jesus? Well, you guys, who's right? Who's right? You guys say we have to worship here on this mountain in Jerusalem on Zion. But where should we worship? Shouldn't it be in Samaria? Mixed marriages were a problem and were dealt with. You read Ezra chapters 9 and 10. Home again. What now? So let me share with you a few things about us and being home again. And we'll end with this. What now? To be faithful to God and not repeat former foolishness. Now, this, this is in regards to the Israelites coming back home. Um, that's why I said, you know, they remember 70 years ago. We were just foolish until 2 Chronicles 36, remember? God tried all. He sent people. He sent people. He sent people. They mocked his messengers. They, 
they rebuked and persecuted the prophets until there, what were those five words? Until there was no what? Remedy. God did all he could. So I like to think that when all of the exiles return home, hopefully they're reminding themselves, let's not be so foolish as to commit the former mistakes that led us to be captives in the first place. The second one, is what now it was important for them to unite together. It was extremely important that they not be divided amongst themselves now that they had to reestablish a nation, a government, neighborhoods, um, business, religious services. It was important to come together as one. It's extremely important. A house divided will what? Fall. A house divided will fall. So this is important for them. Now as for us, again, you know, I'm not saying that we were exiled of, of, because of the pandemic, because of our own foolish rebellion against God. That's not what happened. But I would invite you, now that we are reestablishing our worship services and coming back together on Sabbath mornings, perhaps it would be a good time to think about ways in your life, in my life, that need to be reformed. A new start, coming back to God's house. A new start. And it's important to be united. The third one is to be grateful for God's mercy. Do you think God allowed the Israelites to go back to uh, Israel because they were so good and holy and perfect back in Babylon? No. God's grace, His mercy, His acts of kindness is 99.9% usually not based upon our good deeds that lead him to do something good for us, right? It's quite the opposite. God promised in Jeremiah, after 70 years, I will bring you back to this land. It doesn't say after 70 years, you guys are going to fix up your act. You're going to become a different people. You're going to be amazing. And that's why I'm going to bring you back at the end of 70 years. That's not what he says, based on God's mercy. So now that we're back in the Lord's house, Let's thank God's mercy. He's always merciful. The next one is uh, don't play the blame game. Now, I know I'm using my imagination when I say maybe the younger people, the kids, will say, well, it's your fault. We were innocent. We were just little kids at the time. It was you as mom and dad, grandpa. It was our grandparents that wanted to rebel against the king of Nebuchadnezzar. When Jeremiah said, don't rebel against him. Do what he says. And King Zedekiah rebelled against him. And, and people were just foolish. And their sins and their continual worship of other pagan gods led to that whole problem in the first place. But let's not play the blame game. And this is the reason why I say this. Now in the context of the pandemic. You have probably heard that some people are blaming the Chinese. How many of you have ever heard that? How many of you have heard that it's the Americans to blame for the pandemic? I've heard both sides. Some are blaming uh, Donald Trump for not uh, acting sooner than he did. And the other side will say, well, he cut off travel from China to the United States early on. What more do you want? I mean, you'll get both sides of the story. You may have people blaming others for not wearing masks. It's not the time to play politics and do any blaming. We have safety measures in place. Um, I, I committed a mistake when, when Mildred and Darren and I were in the office and we prayed. I said, I don't know if you caught this, Mildred, where's Darren? I don't know if you guys caught this, but usually before we come out, we have a word of prayer. And I don't see Darren here, so I'll talk to you, Mildred. So I don't know if you caught this, but I said, let's pray. And I kind of did this. <laughs> I kind of did this because that's what we're used to doing. It's hard to form new habits because when we always pray in there, I... I, you know, we, we come together and pray. And I kind of did that, and we were praying, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Maintain the six-foot distance. <laughs> well, we weren't that close, though. We didn't come in that close. Um, but anyways, um, this, you know, don't, I'm not saying everybody's blaming each other, but that's what they had to refrain from. Remember history, more often than not, it repeats. Do you agree with that statement? This whole exile of God's people going into Babylon because of their own disobedience and rebellion against God 
I'm not going to say it's going to repeat. It has repeated since this time, time and time again. What I mean by that is that people apostatize. People throughout history turn their back on God because the grass is greener on the other side, supposedly. Or for other reasons, like Jesus himself said in the, his parable of the farmer sowing seeds and it lands on different types of grounds. One is fallow, the other is horrible, one is rocky. Just like Jesus said, some people are more receptive than others. And some people that are receptive, they're receptive for a while. For a while. Because, as you know, when you join God's people and you believe in Christ in your heart, and you start going to church, and you're establishing new relationships and new friends, but more so you're following God, and you want to read the Bible and pray and all of that stuff, guess what begins to happen? Things get rough. You know I'm telling the truth. Things get rough. Problems start happening. Your car breaks down. Your friends are acting funny towards you. Things just, things will happen. Years ago, I preached a sermon called, After Water Comes Dirt. You're not going to remember this, but it was entitled, After Water Comes Dirt. And it was a sermon about baptism. After water refers to the baptismal tank. You get baptized, and you're just so joyful, and this is amazing. And you're all soaking wet. And you come out wet, praising God. But what happens after you take a shower, after you're baptized? You get dirty again. Just because you're baptized and you want to have a new lease on life with God doesn't mean you're not going to get dirty. Doesn't mean dirt will stay out of your life. Problems will come. And in fact, our arch enemy, whom we call Satan, will step up his efforts to really discourage you and attack you in ways to try and discourage you and veer you off the straight and narrow. And that happens. But in the broad prophetic sense, ooh, I'm going to tell you, this is going to happen in the broad prophetic sense on the planet according to the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation mentions Babylon, spiritual Babylon. What now? Except that there are new norms, such as the tape here. When the people came back to their home, it was good to be home, but there were new norms. Things needed to be done, extra hard work. That was just, there was new norms that had to take place. The same thing for us today. There's still work to be done, right? There's a lot of work to be done. You saw that graph. There were reforms and the walls needed to be built uh, for them in those days. The temple needed to be rebuilt. There was a lot of work to be done. Our work is still the same. Because of this pandemic and the quarantine, our work has not changed. It hasn't changed. There's still witnessing to be done. There's work to be done. It's not just about us keeping safe in our own little cloister, religious cloister with stained glass windows. There's work to be done out there. Now, because of the new normals, you know, the specifics, there are specifics that are changing, you know, distancing, etc. You know, many of you will probably not go and give a Bible study at home because the person may not want it or you may not want that. So we've got to figure out new methods and ways to do our main work, which is what? Winning souls. There's still work to be done. And I think I just have one more. Maybe that's the last one. That was, that was the last one. Um, 13 under quarantine or 15 in quarantine. Um, and I am one of them. I think I, during this quarantine period, I think I gained about three pounds. There's people, I, my wife has noticed it at her job, right? I thought you told me about gaining weight. I just said I gained three pounds. Um, you've, uh, and you, can only, you can answer this yourself. People under the quarantine, habits may have changed. Temptations may have been succumbed in the sense of gaining weight. I gained like three pounds. I try to be active at home. I have, done, I have not done more yard work. I don't think in my life as I have during this pandemic. I, my wife knows this. I've just done busy uh, at home. Now that we're in worship here, 
there's going to be new normals. During the quarantine of not coming here, you may have to get rid of old habits. So this is where I'm going with this. Because we're live streaming right now, it may be easy to just stay at home, stay in your PJs, eat a bagel, lay down, and watch the worship service in the comfort of your own bedroom. Now, what I'm going to say is if you're physically able to come, because I want to exclude the elderly who are homebound, so this isn't referring to them. And if you're healthy enough to come, so I'm excluding those elderly who do not feel comfortable coming yet, or those who are sick, but if you are, so they're excluded, if you are able to come, physically able, physically well, and you can come, come to worship. I'm looking at our, a family out here in our congregation. You live, what, uh, 120 miles away? <laughs> how, how many miles? 65? 50? 38? I thought you lived in another time zone. <laughs> well, there's some families that live, there's a, the, the Sasek family lives far away. They, uh, my wife and I often admire them, especially Juliet's mom. Because they live so far away, and yet they're the earliest here. There are new uh, groundskeepers here, and they're always here and always volunteering for events. And yet they live in two time zones away. <laughs> I, but it's it's far. It's far. What was an hour? They live an hour away. So what I want to say is this: Do not use this quarantine as an excuse to exercise laziness when, honestly, you can come to this worship service and join us if you feel it's safe. So we're respecting your, 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 your desires. If you feel it's safe, and if you can come, then come. That's what I'm saying. Some habits that we may have formed, we'll have to uh, make some new habits and start coming again. I want to encourage you. I hope this was uh, informative and inspirational. It's good to be back home, amen? It's good to be here, even though I am cooking up here because I don't know what happened to our air conditioning. <laughs> How many of you are hot today? I am, I'm just sweating up here, but it's good to be back home, amen? Um, why don't we have a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us back, Lord. And Lord, we're not being judgmental on those who are staying home for their own good reasons. So I am not referring to those good reasons in my last comments. But we thank you for those who have joined us via uh, the screen. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for us being here together. It's good to be back home, Lord, and to be in the house of the Lord, like King David said. Continue to bless us, Lord, and lead us and guide us from here on forward. There's things that still need to be done, and we need to uh, get those wheels moving and and moving forward in that direction uh, again and doing services and activities. And Lord, give us wisdom to exercise these safe measures and uh, give us wisdom and give us your protection. Thank you for, for this worship, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you. We're not going to sing a closing hymn. Our deacons or will dismiss you. They're going to dismiss by pew and then wait a little bit before they dismiss the next pew. And just remember your offerings, if you have not done so yet, your lamb's offering, your Sabbath school offerings, and your regular offerings and tithe will be collected at the end. So I hope you filled out your tithe envelopes. Um, if you going to give cash, that's going to automatically be forwarded to uh, the Pacific Union. They, they won't be staying here. So God bless you. And happy Sabbath. Um, and your loose offerings, I'm sorry. Yes, loose offerings will automatically be forwarded. Any cash uh, will be automatically forwarded. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. And be safe. And we'll see you next Sabbath. And also, I forgot to mention, every Tuesday, we're, we are still Zooming. And for those of you who are going to join us on Tuesday night, I have some books that I want to give you that we're going to be using for our Tuesday night Zoom meetings. 
And so just uh, meet up here and I will get you those books. God bless you and our deacons will dismiss you. For those of you who want those books, please come forward. Please come forward and meet here on this side.